For many parents, the teen years are something to be dreaded. After all, we all know that parenting teenagers is not always fun. And yet, what if you could actually really enjoy the teen years as you are raising your little human beings into be the amazing individuals that God created them to be with the life that God created them to have. Well, today on the Equipping Godly Women podcast, we are talking with Connie Albers, author of the book, Parenting Beyond the Rules, Raising Teens with Confidence and Joy. As the mother of five children who are on their way out of the house, um, who also homeschooled and pursued a professional career, she did it all, Um, Connie has a lot of great wisdom and advice for any parents of teens or parents whose children are approaching the teen years soon. I know in this talk, I got so much great perspective and advice um, from Connie, and I just know that you're going to love it too. So if you are a parent of teens or your kids are headed there soon, definitely stay tuned for this interview because it is one that you are not going to want to miss. All right, today on the Equipping Godly Women podcast, we are talking with Connie Albers, author of the book, Parenting Beyond the Rules, Raising Teens with Confidence and Joy. Thank you so much, Connie, for being here with us today. Oh, thank you for having me, Brittany. I love being on your show. Well, can you get us started just by telling us a little bit about yourself, um, what you do, and a little bit about your family? Sure. I'm a mom of five, five grown children now. We had five and seven years and three are married. My hubby and I have been together. We've been married for about 34, well, about, we've been married for 34 years. And we uh, have just really enjoyed our parenting journey. It hasn't been easy, obviously. Parenting isn't, but that's what led to the whole book. Uh, By nature, I am a mompreneur. I love uh, starting, uh, starting and running things. So throughout most of my life, I have Um, run different organizations. I've been a spokesperson for a Fortune 500 company. I've also had the privilege of homeschooling my children, which was a fun endeavor, especially back when I started. Um, And I've just, I guess I've been fortunate enough to be able to do a lot of things. I currently just finished some work for Social Media Examiner. I've been involved in the social media space for about 10 years now, and I really take the information that I learned from social media and I apply it to how families need to be aware and informed and use social media. And that has become quite a passion of mine. That's great. I can't even imagine raising uh, five kids in seven years, plus homeschooling, plus all of the other um, incredible things you have on your plate. I like my brain does not compute. That is crazy. Um, and another thing in your book that I thought was not crazy, but different in a good way was that you mentioned, um, and a whole premise of your book is that the teen years are not something to dread, but that they can actually be enjoyed. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Why is it that you loved the teen years so much and why did you find them so enjoyable? Why this age? Because that's when they're becoming the person that God created them to be. You've spent all this time forming and fashioning and teaching them their manners and how to clean up and how to clean up after themselves. And now when they hit the teen years, they start this journey on self-discovery. Who am I? How, where do I belong? What's my identity? Um, who, what family am I, you know, like where's, where do I fit inside of this family? And what has God uniquely designed me? just me to do. And as a parent, you get the front row seat. You get to help form and fashion them. You get to help them kind of like take a flashlight and shine a light on the path. And you do that by learning about who they are as people. And that comes by way of observation and really paying attention. So when most parents start to dread the years, I say, let's celebrate them. Because in a few short years, that season of of raising children will come to an end and all that you poured into them uh, will be launched out into the market market space or they'll go on to college. But that's why I I am so positive about the the teen years. We, We have one opportunity to create a childhood and why not celebrate it and not dread it? Uh, and I know that a lot of parents are very fearful. 
They're afraid they're going to ruin their child. They're afraid that they're going to do something wrong or they're going to miss something. You know, oh my word, we're going to, we're, they're going to have gaps. Yes, they're going to have gaps, just like you had gaps. But I am all about building a relationship during the teen years so that when they are in their 20s or 30s or beyond, you enjoy the fruit of that relationship. You enjoy, like tonight, my daughter and I went to dinner and just hung out and chatted about life and what's going on with her. And it wasn't mom saying, I haven't seen you in a while, sweetie. You don't call me. It was her saying, mom, you've been really busy lately. Can we go for dinner? That's the kind of stuff I want to, and the vision I want to instill in parents is, what do you want when your children don't have to call you? What do you want when your children are 20 something or 30 something? What, what's that dynamic and what's that relationship going to be like? And I say, if it matters then, like when they're 20 or 30 or beyond, then it has to matter today. And that's why the teen years are so important. That sounds really nice to have that relationship with your kids, but I know that unfortunately a lot of moms don't have that relationship with their teenagers, um, not because they don't want it, but something just has happened along the way. You mentioned fear a minute ago, that parents have a lot of fear in raising their children, but can you tell us a little bit more, what are some of the other most common difficulties that parents have as they're raising their teenagers? Why is it so hard for the average parent? Well, because as the child is growing, you've had complete control. You pretty much make the schedule and decide everything that's going to happen and your child goes along with it. Then they hit the tween and teen years and they start pushing back. They start pushing back on the rules. They start pushing, they start resisting those limits and boundaries that have once worked. And your parenting style has to adjust because as I say in the book, teens change, parents adjust. And that's a little backwards because it used to be many years ago, well, these are just the rules of the house and this is what you have to do. Um, parenting has changed a lot since then. Our culture has changed. And we've we've come to learn that when we we have to have those rules, we have to have those limits, we have to have boundaries in order to maintain order in within our home and safety for our children because we know that a child left to themselves brings forth destruction that does happen but your child has to be given some freedom to grow into the person that they are becoming so a lot of times they start pushing back on what they perceived as your control you they've they start to feel like everything you're doing is all about control and then you start to feel like everything they're doing is just resisting or rebelling against it and I'm saying there is a beautiful delicate dance that happens in the transition years of, be of leaving childhood and becoming an adult that a parent must go through and that is an adjusting their style and it's starving that fear and if your relationship is not in a good place right now you can't quit because it's always too soon to quit. They're not finished. They are a work in progress and they may be resisting you today, but they might not resist you tomorrow. So there are areas that you learn, where can we lighten up? Where can we adjust? Where can we pivot? And I love to say, we have to master the art of the pivot because your children are constantly changing. And many times, you know, Brittany, frankly, they don't even know what's going on inside of them. Developmentally, brain developmentally, they're changing. Their brain chemistry is changing. Hormonally, they're changing. And they can't always articulate it. So they get in conflicts with their parents, again, because they feel safe with you. Um, and they know that you're probably the one person who isn't gonna give up on them. Whereas their friends will turn on them, society will, They'll get in trouble at school. They'll get in trouble with, you know, other things that sports maybe that they're involved with. Does, you know, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you along those lines, though, that brings up a question for me. Um, so it makes a lot of sense how teenagers are not always going to understand the things that they are going through and they're going to go through some things and there's going to be some conflict in the home. But how can we as parents decide the best way to deal with that conflict? And what I mean is how do we know when it is a time to like lay down the law or a time to pry and like keep on them or when we really just need to back off and give them space? Because I would hate as a parent if my kid is going through something to not be there for them, but then I wouldn't 
I would also not want to be super controlling and, you know, hovering over them if developmentally, like they just need some time to figure it out on their own. So how do we decide the best course of action when we're going through these difficulties with teenagers? It first starts with prayer. Then it starts with observation. And then it starts with knowing your child. So those three things, uh, prayer, you know, uh, God is the architect. He has formed and fashioned that child for a specific calling and purpose. There are not many us, you know, as much as we want them to be, or some, some parents want their children to be kind of just like them, because what's so wrong with us? Um, as much as we would like them to toe the line and do everything we ask of them, they have their own race and they have to find their own lane. So prayer and then observation. Getting to know your child takes time and it takes attention, which means you've got to leave margin in your family's life. There has to be time for you to listen to the, the words that they say, the unspoken words, where they, find, where they spend their time. And when I say where they spend their time, some kids are, um, uh, they can read all day long and some children are risk takers and some children are by nature, they're people pleasers. Some children by nature aren't people pleasers and they really don't care what people think. So to answer your questions, it's kind of like, what are the parenting hacks that we need to have? Well, you need to understand the world they're living in and how they're influenced by their peers. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes it can be helpful too, um, and I'd love for you to share more about this, but especially if one of the children has a similar personality to one of the parents. Um, I know for us, my oldest child is just like me in good ways and bad. Um, and my husband is not shy of telling me this and I have no problem with it. Like he is just like me. Um, and then our second child is just like my husband. So when we have those issues, with my oldest child, I feel like sometimes I'm the one who can understand a little better. Um, but then when my second child starts coming up, I'm gonna be like, nope, I have no <laughs> idea. This is all you because I do not understand this. Like he's wonderful, I love him, but like, it's just different. Um, so how though, this is another thing I wanna ask you. How do you navigate that though, if you are a parent who feels like you kind of understand where that kid is coming from and you feel like, okay, I kind of know what they need. I can see this, I can understand this. Um, and then you have a spouse who has a totally different perspective or idea on how kids should be raised. Um, how do you deal with that respectfully of everybody? Yes, that's the great, great question. Um, it is important for the, the mom and the dad, for the, the couple to be on the same page. But to be honest with you, you are describing what most families look like. And that is mom and dad aren't always going to be on the same page. They're not always going to be in agreement. And that is by design. Opposites are usually attracted to each other. Uh, there are going to be like I have five very, very unique children with completely different strengths and makeups and what one enjoys, the other doesn't. And my husband and I are, are polar opposites. I mean, it is, it's a hoot really that we've managed to parent all of our children. And we laugh now, but when, when you are tackling the teen years, you've got to try as much as possible to be on the same page. So carry the conversations that are critical, like really important, like you know there's issues going on or you're concerned about issues that are happening within a specific child. Go to and talk away from that child. Don't don't talk in earshot because they're listening. And and teens have this unique way of not because they're little manipulators, they're not, but they do have a way of playing each parents against each other and they kind of know who to ask which question of like Who's going to be more inclined to let someone go to a sleepover or have the car keys, which parent that night than the other? And I, you, so you go and you talk privately, get on the same page. If you are in disagreement, then you've got to come to a point where you say, one has to say, okay, we may not fully agree, or I don't fully agree with you, but I trust you. I trust that, you know, we both have the best interests of our children's well-being, both physically, mentally, and spiritually. And let's try that. If it doesn't work, we'll, we will adjust. We will make a change. And 
in the case, I'll give an example with my husband. I talk about this, Brittany, in the book where I love family meetings. I think they're so productive. And I write a whole chapter on the benefits of having a family meeting. Well, my husband doesn't like meetings. So here I was all prepared for a family meeting. And, and my husband trusted me. He's like, okay, I, I, you know, I'm not... I'm not totally there, but let's, let's do it. And I went, you know, we walked down to the boat dock uh, by the lake and I had my little pad of paper because that's my personality. And I think we're just going to solve all these problems in you know, six steps because that's, you know, everything is solvable. I'm, I'll tell you what's wrong. You're going to see it and understand it. And it's all going to be good because you're going to say, I understand that your wisdom, mom. And it didn't go that way. And my my poor husband was watching my hus my son just kind of wither under mother's wisdom. And my husband spoke up and he said, I, I kind of think we've had enough of this particular meeting. And we had, I had to let go. I had to just back off and say, you know what? this isn't working. This isn't how we need to do this. Um, we're done. You know, meeting is called off or meeting is adjourned. Other parents would have different names for it. Then my husband and I went back, Brittany, and we chatted about that. And I said, what do you think didn't work? And he goes, well, you know, taking a legal size pad of paper is not, you know, it's kind of intimidating <laughs> to, a, you know, a teenager. And he says, you may just want to bring one or two points next time. And I thought, fair enough. Um, and, and so we've had to adjust and pivot. But I will also say this, my that son was a people pleaser. So me going down with my bullet point list of all of his infractions crushed him. It, it made him defeated. Whereas if I would have taken that same pad of paper with the umpteen dozen bullet points that I had on it, another one of my children would have looked at me and said, is that all you have? Um, <laughs> and... It's just the difference of little humans. You're raising little humans to become the, the people that God made them to be. So kind of reframing your question, you and your, you and your spouse need to discuss what's going to be the approach. And then if that other spouse starts to feel like it's not going well, then you need to, you need to be willing to you know, retreat and say, okay, we're, we're finished. This didn't go very well. It was, it didn't accomplish what I wanted. I didn't want us to get this to be heated. I didn't want to hurt your feelings. I wasn't trying to dominate the conversation or make you feel like you are, you know, a bad teenager. I was just trying to work something out. Let dad and I talk about this and we'll figure out another approach. Are you okay with that? And during the teen years, the more you can get them involved in the decision making process because again they are becoming who god made them to be when they feel like they have a say and that you are listening to them they're more inclined to listen to what you have to say so just kind of let that sink in for a little bit when they know you're willing to listen to them even if they're rebutting something an accusation that you are leveling against them let's just say they didn't do something you said they should have done and they're refuting what you've said if, if they know you're going to hear them out and consider what they said instead of overreacting or reacting abruptly, they're more likely to feel safe to be open and honest with you. Because as they get older, the conversations, quite frankly, get really um, deeper. They become they can become um, more problematic. So you want to start that from your early teen years as you grow. And if they are already, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, and you're into some real intense struggles, step back and examine the approach that you have at trying to resolve the conflicts. There's going to be conflicts. There's going to be difficulties. There's going to be disagreements. Ask them how they would solve this problem. Ask them what they think what if we try this? How do you think we should approach that? All of a sudden, you have made them part of the family and not the object of your, you know, corrections. Yeah, I love that um, piece of advice, especially as our kids get older. Um, I love that you, you just kind of shared how, you know, we don't have to have it perfect the first time. You know, we're going to make mistakes and there's grace for both us as parents and for our children and that we can go back and reevaluate um, and we can work with our kids and partner with them. Yes, we're still the parent, um, but partner with them 
in helping them to become, you know, who God created them to be. Um, I had another question that I wanted to ask you a minute ago, though, when you were talking about your um, your parenting style and your husband's parenting style. In the book, you talked about several different parenting styles and how we all are a little different. Can you share a little bit more about what those parenting styles are and what those look like so that anybody who is listening can kind of get a sense of, okay, this is the kind of parent I am and this is how it all fits together. Sure. I, in the book, I talk about five parenting types, the authoritative, the permissive, the hovering, the helicopter, and the lawnmower. And actually, there's a new one that is really gaining traction. But many years ago, probably like when we were kids, it was the authoritative or the permissive, either the parent who said, oh, it'll all work out. Everything's going to be fine. Sure, go to that party. Nothing's going to happen. And they really didn't have a bunch of rules and regulations. It was just um, not not totally chaos, but just they were very laid back, relaxed type of parents. Then you had authoritative parents or authoritarian type of parents. Basically, it was, these are the rules of the house. And as long as you follow the rules of the house, everybody's going to be happy. The problem is teenagers don't always like the rules. Again, they start to push back on them because they're growing up into the person God made them to be. It does not mean that we allow them to be disrespectful. So please understand that. The hovering in the helicopter came in along uh, about the time the internet became, because we know technology is, is neutral. There's nothing bad about technology, but the internet isn't safe. It's not safe for our teens. And that's when hel ho hovering and helicopter parenting came into play because we wanted to keep a sh close eye. It was new. We didn't know who our kids were talking to. We didn't know who was talking to our children. And <clears throat> over the years, that's just intensified. Um, I understand what's happening on the dark web and it is flat out scary. I know about these millions of apps that are anonymous that your kids are accessing that most or many teens are accessing that their parents don't even realize. They kind of know about them, but they don't know them, which has caused us to kind of hover a little bit and 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 helicopter. We just we kind of be around just to, for protection. We don't inherently mean to squash or control. Um, some kids feel like that's what we're doing. Others don't mind it because that's just that child. They, you know, some children, they don't care. You know, so their life's an open book. But the lawnmower parent has been more of a new phenomenon. It's it's the parent who realizes that life, you know, they, they know life isn't fair and they know that uh, their children need a leg up. So they are willing to not only just hover and helicopter, but man, they're going to mow the yard. They're going to make sure that their child doesn't stumble. They, they don't get into sites or, or find their way into trouble. They control, they... Um, they try to regulate and create a, a secure environment in which their child never fails, stumbles, or falls. And that's where the lawnmower parent has come in. Now, the sixth one is it's you see it in the Olympics where it's on the ice cream, uh, on the, they have the ice and they're called it's sweeping. It's it's where they take the little brooms and they take the ice and they're sweeping and the the person throws that heavy ball and they try to get it to go as far as they can go. That is utter control. Um, the reason this is the reason I talk about this is there are times we we do need to to go before our kids. There are times we need to have hover and be a helicopter mom, especially if our children uh, are more risk takers. They're more prone toward thinking rules are mere suggestions. Oh, I don't really need to do that. That that sounds great for you. And that probably works for my brother, but me, mm -mm. I'm going to do it a different way. And they're more likely to find themselves in trouble. Um, and they need a little bit more hovering and, and, and um, lawnmower protection type because they can get themselves into some serious trouble. And that's why I talk about adjusting your parenting style. One way just doesn't work during the teen years. And what worked today might not work tomorrow, especially as your teen starts developing and the hormones start to kick in. Um, and, you know, 
to be honest with you, moms, we have not even really talked much about our own hormones start to change. And so we could be having a rough day at the same time our teen is having a rough day. And that's not a fun place, like happy home. And there, that's why I, I talk about the adjusting in our parenting style. We can't dictate a set of rules. We can't be a no rules, no boundaries. We can't completely hover and helicopter over them. And we can't totally keep them from making any mistakes because they need to grow. They need to stumble. They need to learn determination and resilience and persistence and all of the character qualities that come with trial and error. And that all happens during the teen years. If, if it doesn't, then it's delayed adolescence and they hit college and they just don't even know. They go wild because they don't know how to self-regulate. Yeah, that makes sense. So what you're saying is that there's not one right parenting style out of these five that we should you know, aim for this one, but just depending on the circumstance or the personality of our kids, we might need to take on more characteristics of one or the other depending on what's going on. Is that correct? That is exactly right. Sometimes you're gonna, you do have to lay down the law. I'm sorry. We said no cell phones in the room at night. And when I came to check on you, I saw the light illuminating from the sheet and so you clearly did not honor our instructions so no you may not go with your friend to you know the movies or to whatever activity that you deem is important or because you didn't honor what we had asked and we trusted you and that's where the whole dynamic and this is why i love the teen years because there's so many different elements at play so they don't honor what you ask them to do and they've been part of that decision-making process. Do you agree that you need sleep? Yes, I agree that you need sleep. So then if you go to bed and you're up and you get up in the middle of the night because somebody's texting you or because you've got a video game or because of whatever reason you happen to have, and you have agreed with us that sleep is important because if you don't get it the next morning, you're grumpy with the family, you're grumpy at school, you're not getting good grades, then there's a consequence. So kids during the teen years learn what we as adults already know. There are natural consequences. And when they are part of that decision-making process, they start to learn to own their own responsibility. And that is an important point, that they learn to own it. Yes, I agree to this. Yes, I know this was wrong. Yes, you did tell me to do this. Yes, I do need to honor my mother and father. No, I didn't do this. I knew it was wrong. And these are the consequences. And it's, it is, it sound, it's, it's a beautiful, complicated dance that you learn every single day. And some days you step on each other's toes and some days it's just, it's beautiful. And that's why I love the teen years so much. And that's why I like talking about it because they're not predictable. And it's like a puzzle. You're figuring out, you know, what piece goes where on which day. But in the end, there's hope. And the hope is that they aren't finished. Um, God is in control. God is the architect. And when you had asked me that question and I said, pray, we have to remember that we have to consult the architect. He has the blueprints and he's trusted us, which is so amazing. He has trusted these imperfect mothers and fathers to raise these imperfect children. And somehow we're going to build this beautiful family that is going to stumble and fall at times. And there may be days or months or years that you wrestle through things but i want you to get the picture of this is a long game not a short game you're not doing a sprint you're doing a marathon and that is even if your child is 17 or 18 years old and you're at odds with each other get to the heart get to the why why are you frustrated with me what am i doing why why do you react when i do this Get them to tell you their why and listen to it. And don't react, just listen. And they'll learn to start trusting you. And the more they trust that you will listen and really hear them, the safer they become with sharing their insecurities, their fears, or their own doubts. That makes a lot of sense. 
Um, that's great advice. So before we wrap up today, though, I have a copy of your book here, Parenting Beyond the Rules, um, and I have read it. But for anybody who is listening, who is thinking the teen years are coming up or I'm in the teen years right now, and this sounds like something that could be really helpful for me, um, can you just tell our listeners today um, a little bit more about your book? What is it about? Who is it for? And how will it help them? I would love to, and I'm going to do it by illustration of the book, so bear with me as I show you the book. On the book, you'll see five paintbrushes. Those five paintbrushes are pretty significant because each of them are varying in sizes, and they each have a different color. Your children are unique masterpieces. They are a masterpiece in the making, and sometimes you use a broad brace, a broad brush with a bold color to lay the foundation. And that foundation is your relationship. And then you let it dry and you step back and you say, okay, now it needs a little touch of grace or character, or it needs some responsibility, or it needs some self-control, or whatever the colors that's making and creating this masterpiece that God has already designed. And you use those different paintbrushes for different reasons. And that is, the purpose of the whole book is you look for and create defining moments and you talk about them often. And you talk about the masterpiece that you're really creating and the masterpiece that God has in mind and in store for them. That it is not your life you're living through them, that it is your life that you're helping them discover and find so that they can be, they can fulfill the calling that God has placed on them. And that is the whole purpose of parenting beyond the rules. We're great at rules. We just have to learn to master the art of the pivot. We have to step back and remind them that they are a masterpiece, that they weren't and they aren't made up of the wrong colors and that their masterpiece is not going to look like somebody else's. That's what makes them unique and that's what makes them an original. Well, this has been so helpful for me and I'm sure for any of our listeners as well today. So thank you, Connie, so much for agreeing to come on and talk with us today. Thank you for having me and thank you listeners for tuning in. I, I think Brittany's show is awesome and I'm sure you learn a lot of great tips um, from Equipping Godly Women. So thank you again, Brittany. All right, so that just about does it for today's podcast episode. If you enjoyed our talk today and got a lot of value out of it, I would love for you to go ahead right now and check out the show notes. Um, I'm going to leave you a link for Connie's book, Parenting Beyond the Rules, Raising Teens with Confidence and Joy. Um, in this book, I've read it. It's really good. She shares a lot of great knowledge and insights of how to raise teens well, and she just really shows you how to paint a picture of possibilities so that you are showing your teens this life that they can have that they can live up to as they follow God and become the people that God has created them to be. Also in the show notes, I have a few other resources that I would love to share for you, just articles I have on my own website in terms of raising great kids and raising great teens. Um, so I would love for you to check those out as well. And as always, if you have not subscribed to the Equipping Godly Women podcast yet, what are you waiting for? I come back very frequently to give you more more advice and knowledge and information and insights on how you can be an amazing Christian wife and mother and how you can love and lead your family well. So we would love for you to join us. Go ahead and hit subscribe if you have not already and check out the show notes below and I will talk to you again real soon. All right. Bye.